So Candace, uh, thanks for your time. Um, I'd like to kind of wind back the clock, obviously doing some amazing things in the middle of the country, light ship capital, uh, among other things. Like I actually, I think it's impressive that you do light ship, but you also do Hillman, which is associated with light ship. Uh, and you do other things. I think there are things that aren't even on your profile that I've learned about, um, while I was in Miami that you do some consulting and, and brand strategy and work with, um, artists and musicians and, and professional athletes. Um, so it's, it's a pretty impressive, just professional resume, but I want to kind of wind back the clock a little bit and talk about like, you know, where did you grow up? Like what, where, what was the Candace of <laughs> the teenage years? What, what did you find yourself doing? What were you into? Like what, what did that look like, uh, for you? Oh, yeah. So um, I'm from Salido, Ohio. I've always been a pretty high energy person. So anyone that knows me knows like um, my nickname as a kid was Bunny um, because of like the Energizer Bunny. That's um, awesome. And so that's like been a long term thing. Um, oh, my goodness. I'm the kid who my dad still talks about like today where he would look in the rearview mirror back at me in the station wagon and I would just be talking to myself. It wasn't necessarily to him. I was just like getting it out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so that's I how I it. am today. I, I like anybody who's around me, I can like talk them to sleep. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it just is what it is. Um, so that's who great. was the Candace of my teenage years? You know, I was really active in high school. So I was on like mm. the religious commission and I was a cheerleader and I was in the marching band on the dance team, twirled a flag. Um, wow. and just kind of like always into as many things as possible to keep me like out of the house. Um, mm. I just didn't want to always be at home. It was a very interesting house. My dad wasn't around a ton and my mother, um, was my mother and she had dr battled her own demons with alcohol. So I was mm. always out, um, always out doing things and wanting to explore the world. Um, and I guess that busy bodiness has gotten me to where I am today. <laughs> yeah. Well, and one of the things that in previous seasons, um, there's, there's been a lot of folks that have done amazing things in their lives and there was a person or their group of people that really influenced them early on. Who was that for you? Like, as you think back, I mean, I'm hearing you say wanting to get out of the house, but clearly you are doing amazing things now. What helped you get there? Like who, who were those, those examples in your life that really kind of helped move you in a direction that like was positive and exciting how did you, how did you get activated at such a young age to, to kind of pursue the dreams that you have? Oh goodness. Um, I think there's always been like, there's, there's been a few people. So in mm -hmm. high school, well, I guess when I was 12, we moved to a house near the university of Toledo and, um, a state Senator lived next door. Um, awesome. her name was Linda Fernie. She never had any children. Um, and was just always so kind to me. Um, I was the oldest child in my household and she would just invite me to dinner at her house. Or, um, I remember for my senior year in high school, she got us tickets to go see Greece at the Stranahan theater. Um, and so it was my first time at the theater and it was just always those little things that allowed me to kind of like see the larger world. Um, so I can say like her kindness, let me to see the arts and help me to understand state government. Um, and just the, just the kindness, I think of strangers is always amazing. Um, hmm. and then in college, um, there was a professor who was, uh, who just found, like took interest in me during like econ 102, I guess he had watched me during econ 101. I had done really well. And then in 102, he said, you know, there's a scholarship available for first gen college students. I looked at your records. looks like you're a first generation college student you should apply for this scholarship um, to get a fellowship um, in econ. And I applied in, a, in two families in, from Cincinnati, paid for the rest of my college career. Um, there was, you know, kind of a travel stipend, a book stipend, paid for room and board, everything. Awesome. And um, there have been people like that throughout my life that have kind of like made a small tweak because I didn't have like the – you know, family pedigree to get me there. It was really more like this, the universe sent me some amazing people to kind of fill mm. in the gaps. Yeah. And I love it. And I think, uh, 
I think that's more commonplace, you know, and we're going to get to kind of like what you're doing now, but you know, you, so you went to college and university in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you find yourself being a founder, which I think, you know, that was, was that right out of college? Where did that kind of enter into your kind of progression of things? How did you, I've had 15 lives. All right. So I know (laughs) there's been a lot of these, like, again, back to the bunny story. Um, Exactly. So in college, I did take a gap year, became a flight attendant. Um, and while I was a flight attendant, they asked me to help do some scheduling. And I realized Mm -hmm. if I did the scheduling stuff, I wouldn't have to fly as many days and I could go back, go back to school. So, um, they were like scheduling people on paper back in the day. So this is like two, well, no, it was 99. Um, so they're still like scheduling people on paper. I basically took my statistics skills from college built a little algorithm or like super complicated Excel spreadsheet for them, scheduled people in two hours. It didn't take two days. Now I still took my two days, <laughs> did what I needed to do, <laughs> but I was able to get that thing done. And I That's used awesome. that scheduling system and what I learned from some of my statistics classes and started building these scheduling systems for um, the Cincinnati Rec- Recreation Commission here. And I started scheduling all the umpires. So that was my first like business outside of college after I, after I graduated. And I used that kind of same scheduling idea when I started a, my small tech company, Hello Parent. So it was a mobile app to help parents connect and organize activities like play dates and mom's night out. And so that whole like methodology of scheduling things has kind of like gone from college and stats class all the way through that company. Um, but when I graduated, I was a consultant um, with some of the, the TAs and a few professors. Um, and then again, but I think that's, yeah. I love the energizer bunny kind of circuitous nature of it. Like you're just seizing opportunities, that's taking, all it's been. taking risk, you know, and you know, my background, I mean, I was in the military then I was a pastor and I worked at a family mm-hmm. office, worked at a manufacturing company now, you know, and it's just, it's people look at my LinkedIn profile and like, where did you come from? Like, they just don't understand how all these things connect. I'm like, sometimes I don't, but, <laughs> uh, but I digress. So, so you were a founder and then, you know, you got involved uh, helping founders. So how did you make the transition from being a founder to then helping support founders and, and why, what was the reason you made that, made that flip? Um, I think it's something I just have always been good at is kind of like building community and helping others. So I'm, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, way back in the day, I owned a fitness studio here in town in Cincy, and it was really focused on supporting women through their pregnancy, postnatal, and kind of through and beyond. And it was that community building that I loved. And so when I kind of started running out of money with my first tech company, um, I had also started a, a thing called the Black Founders Network here in town, where there were Black founders. We all met up once a month um, and shared our network. And that group really like, it was so great for the founders here in town. And it's, we, we will relaunch it post COVID, but you know, for almost six years now, um, it's been a pretty amazing group. And so it all started there in that group with us sharing knowledge, network, you know, investors, lawyers, you name it was that group that really helped. And so that's really what kicked off the accelerator. Yeah. That's great. Well, and we were talking before we jumped on the podcast, just kind of some of the things GAN, GAN Ventures, uh, or GAN rather, uh, Global Accelerator Network is kind of into with, specifically in COVID, I think the mil- mental wellness of founders. And so I think I'd love to kind of get your perspective. I think sometimes, you know, we know founders need capital, founders need mentorship, founders need density and space and connection. Those are those are true. There's no I, I'm just curious, like af- after the number of founders that you've worked with, like, and the number of like just communities in which you've interacted, like what are some of those, those other, other things, those intangible things that founders need? So I'm listening to you talk about this black founders network and it's like, I've got to believe connection and community, just being heard, being seen, being present what, what, from like, that's what I'm it, picking up, but like, what would you say? Like, what are things founders need? If we're, if you're in the business of helping founders, what are the non capital, non, you know, investment type things that we should be thinking about as, as communities to support them? Sure. I think that, you know, again, like multicultural communities are not 
like monolithic. So I'm, I'm not saying this happens for everyone. Sure. Um, but I will say that we've chosen to make like take like a really holistic approach to the way we deal with our founders and talk to our founders. Um, you know, some founders who are from immigrant communities um, sometimes have to have a much kind of higher touch with their family. And so you have to remember that the, their, their nuclear family that they grew up in are sometimes their responsibility. Hmm. And, and many times monetarily sending money back home, being home fairly often, like really being in touch with their family. Um, and so we have to think about that. And when mom or dad gets sick and we're talking about a 35, 40 year old, you know, you know, founder that matters to them because for, in their culture, it is their responsibility to take care of their parents, um, even mm. if they're other people. And so I think there are little tiny things and tweaks that we've had to take, um, you know, as a group. And so we think about those things. We think about, you know, if a, if a person is moving to a town that they don't know about, where's the barber? Where do they worship? Where can they really mm. break bread? Where will they feel safe? Is there a, you know, who are the investors that we're really introducing them to? Because are they all oh. safe spaces? Um, so there's just a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> that you have to think about. And it, people always say to us, like, that seems like the most. But like, change sometimes takes the most. <laughs> so that's what mm. we're doing. Well, and I think, so I was going to ask, we were going to talk a little bit about Lightship and kind of the funds you're working on, but one of the things that I think is distinctive is you actually, correct me if I'm wrong, like live with your founders uh, for a season or, or maybe not in all circumstances, but there's, there is like, as a part of the diligence, there's this opportunity to kind of be in the same place to get to know them. And I have to feel like that's kind of part of what you're talking about. Like you get to see someone, like, talk to us about that a little bit. Like, why do you do that? And, and what does that look like for you? Sure. So in 2018, end of 2018, we acquired a brand called Numia Celebrator. Um, it started back in 2012 uh, and it was kind of like the real world um, meets tech. <laughs> and uh, when it first started, it was three months in a house oh, wow. out in the valley um, teaching founders the the tips and tricks of having a venture back wow. company. Over the years, it morphed into being a one week program, um, and it was hosted in a house. Um, and for a week, uh, the founders, uh, you know, break bread and work with um, break. What did we say? Eat, break bread, and build um, their company alongside mentors, investors, um, and kind of a, just a value creation team. Um, helping them to grow their businesses. So over the course of five days, um, we, we live with them. And uh, for a long period of time, I was cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, alongside the founders, cleaning the house and all those things. And you learn a lot about people um, when you're in a personal space. It's not for everyone, but I can say that we've invested in companies from that boot camp that we offer still. Um, and then... Post investment, just depending on what program or maybe they just come through the portal, um, we do spend two or three days with them um, in a, just whatever region is appropriate for them in the country. Um, and we give them a tour of the city that we're in. We spend time eating meals together. And for a few days, we work on growth. And we offer that time to them in perpetuity, as long as they would like to be a part and, and want help building value. And if they feel like we can build value, that's what we will continue to do. And I think it's an amazing process. Yeah. Well, I loved, I loved your previous example about immigrant founders. Um, because I think one of the things that I've really appreciated about you getting to know you a little bit more over the last several months is just your intentionality of like listening to the person and I think sometimes with, with investors, we come in to the boardroom, so to speak, and we have all of these assumptions, like we look at the financials, we make our assessment, and we just vomit an opinion without actually even asking a question as to like why something might be the way it is. And so I love like, as you think about like working with underestimated founders, founders of color, women, LGBTQ, people with disabilities, I've got to believe like 
just listening to them like, and asking them questions is super helpful in understanding like wh that, why they made the decisions they made. And that like, there may be a path for like, Hey, maybe we'd do it differently in the future, but you know, at least understand instead of coming in with all of these kind of like preconceived notions and assumptions, and then just <laughs> throwing that on the table. <laughs> yeah. We have to say like, when we start a, a, a strategy session with the team, we're always like, this is your company. You know what's best. And you can push mm. back at any time on any opinion that we have. But we're coming to you with, you know, what has worked with others, what has worked for growth, and we want you to push back if necessary. And if you leave here and you're super excited about it and you get back and it's not working, let's, let's revisit it. Or you continue running your strategy, but we know that they know best. Um, or, or else they wouldn't be there. I mean, I'll give it a yeah. small example. So we invested in this awesome company called Healthy Roots Dolls. Um, it's a, it's a multicultural doll that helps young black girls to better love their hair. And right now they're coming out with a few more dolls in the line. And she sends me some of the, the, the test dolls and I look at them and uh, the founder said, Yelitsa says to me, so what do you think of the eyebrows? I said, the eyebrows look great. And she's like, oh, I, you know, I don't actually know why I asked you because you were around in the 90s and you had like 90s brows. And right now these little girls love caterpillar brows. And she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. We don't know it all. We don't know it all. And I've got to listen to them and, and the direction of their company. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did, how, did you, how did you figure that out? Like, is this just something you've always done or is this something like you experienced... And you're like, we're going to do it differently as you built Lightship. Like, what did that look like? Because this is, this is radical. I mean, I, to a point, like, I think the way you interact with the founders is, is not one of superiority. It's one of cooperation. Like, you, you win, we win. We win, you win. It's, it's, it's this mutuality. How did you come to that? How did, you, how did you arrive at that kind of flow for the way you work with the founders that are in your portfolio? Ooh. So I think that together, my, the other general partner, Brian and I, I think that we both come from an upbringing that we like to, you know, build people up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Buddhist. And so for me, like none of this stuff is about me. It's about the founder and, and them winning and the universe will provide for me. Right. And so if I put all of my energy behind them, I know that it will propel them forward. Um, mm. And I don't know, I, I think just like you said, listening matters and paying attention to the founder matters. Um, and just for some, I think it's just the culture of the organization, the, of who we've hired over time and what we've found works best. Um, we've been tweaking this model since 2017 when we started the accelerator. Sure. I think in the beginning, we were very much focused on we're going to follow uh, global accelerator networks plan to the T, right? We're going to do this 12 week program or 16 week program, and we're going to run straight through it. What we found was we needed to make some tweaks because it didn't work for our particular demographic of people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And so we've made little changes over time. Like, um, the timing of the program that we offered through the accelerator um, didn't necessarily work for working moms. So we didn't have any parents in our first cohort. Why? The timing didn't work. And so we had to make kind of take a blended approach to in-person versus virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, we, it's, it's been a, just been tweaked over the last few years. I love it. I love, I, and I love that. I mean, that's, the, the, the ability to kind of just be honest and to say, we don't know everything. We're going to, we're going to try this, you know, we're going to do the global accelerator network thing and we'll learn as we go and tweak it. You know, like there's, there's an evolution of things. We're going to get better at this, um, which is, which is great. So I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit. So now outside of everything else you're working on lightship capital. <laughs> so just, I'm going to park that cause you do so many other things, but lightship capital specifically, you know, $50 million fund headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, focused on the Midwest, focused on a very unique demographic of founders. Talk to me about your vision and, and why, why do you feel like Lightship needs to exist and why does it exist in Cincinnati, Ohio? Oh, okay. So 
Um, why does it need to exist? Oh my goodness. Well, 0.67% <laughs> of black founders um, are venture backed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so all of venture for last year, that was the number, 0.67. That's not even 1%, and we are 13% of the population. So that's where this all started. It was black founders not getting funded. And then recognizing when you look up, oh, you're not getting funded, and you're not getting funded either? Like, mm -hmm. oh, women? Yeah. You know, like, we're 50, 51% of the population. And so, you know, that's the reason why. And then if I think about being a capitalist, there is a market failure. So the market has failed this <laughs> particular group of people. Um, and we're attacking that market failure. We're, we're saying, okay, well, if no one else is going to get in here, we're just going to shoot these fish in a barrel. Um, and it, I, I think that is absolutely the case and why. Um, so yeah, we're going to go after it. Why Cincinnati? Oh, you know, <laughs> so when we, first started the Black Founders Network meetup group, we went to a couple of local organizations like trying to get funding um, because there were a lot of meetups at the time and people would kind of sponsor pizza and beer, cheese and wine. So we went around and we asked and a lot of folks were like, no, I don't know about that one. We don't want to touch it. Mm. We're not going to put any money into it. It's grassroots. Keep on moving with it. And I would look at the other like tech meetup groups and go, well, why not us? And so for a few years, I bootstrapped that on my own. Wow. And um, then we started having tough conversations with each other about like, but why? But why? <laughs> like, but what's going on? And if you, if you really dig back, there are some fantastic articles <laughs> written because we've like talked to the news, we talked to council because we couldn't quite mm. understand the disparity between um, founders of color and women and other people that were getting funded in the community. And so really over the last five and a half, six years in Cincinnati, the leaders of Cincinnati, including myself, now I've become a leader, um, we've been having tough conversations on race and placemaking and um, building organizations and inclusion. And it's taken us a few years to get here, but through really candid and tough conversations and giving each other grace, that's why Lightship is able to exist here. Um, and... I can say that the folks at Cincy Tech, you know, I talk about Mike Venerable all the time. He's my favorite human. Um, Wendy Lee, when she was at Centrifuge, was a huge proponent of what we were doing. Eric Weissman, um, you name it. There are some amazing people here, and they've all cheered me on. And in the beginning, many of them gave me a portion of their budgets. Mm -hmm. So we got started on a $175,000 grant from Cincy Tech the Brandery, Centrifuge, um, Hamilton County, County, Hamilton County Business Development Center. They, they put the, it pulled their money together for us to start. And so folks don't realize that. Like they, they pulled for us in 2017. It's that's been awesome. a long time. And so why here? It's because of that energy that started years ago. Um, that's and awesome. then you add the icing to the cake that the state um, is involved as well. Yeah. I So I recently went on the, um, I don't know what to call it, the, the Brackeen Tour of Miami. Oh, that's, that, we call that the Brian <laughs> Tour. That is definitely the Brian the Tour. The Brian Tour. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, and it was phenomenal. So he and I are on the board of Endeavor together, Endeavor Midwest. And um, I was I was floored. I, I've done a lot of uh, ecosystem tours. And, you know, I've been to Cincinnati. Um and I've, been, I've obviously been impressed with Cincinnati. Miami was interesting. And I think the thing between the two of them, and I think more so the people that Brian introduced me to and now just talking with you, is what I, what I think is distinctive in ecosystems that I think are getting it is they have this kind of this ethos that everyone is welcome. Uh, if you show up, if you're a giver, if you're willing to contribute, we may, you know, we may disagree ideologically on various things, but if you're willing to contribute, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to work together. You know, we, we're going to push each other. We're going to ask hard questions. Like, I don't think we shy away from asking hard questions. Like you said, even uh, when you were building uh, the black tech group uh, in Cincinnati. But I think, I think that's interesting to think about like, we're, you know, a welcoming uh, where we're not going to look at like where you went to high school. You know, in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky, very, you know, old school parish community. 
when they say, where'd you go to school? It wasn't college. It was. <laughs> they do that here in Cincy too. Yeah. And so you never feel, you never feel like you're from here and I've been here 16 years. And so that's an indictment, but I think, how do we embrace that? How do we continue to nurture? You know, like I was in Miami a couple of weeks ago and it was, that was it. I mean, the sheer volume of people that come, the mayor is a Cuban American Republican and yet he's doing amazing things with people from all different walks of life. And it's just like, come, come, come. Like, if you want to do, if you want to help, if you want to be, let's do it. Let's do it together. Uh, and I think that when I say why Cincinnati, I was kind of a softball because I think I've experienced that not just from the Cincy Tech scene, but also your leadership, Brian's leadership over the years. And I think that's that's something to take note of. That's not, you know, the normal kind of, I think the three legs of the stool, you know, capital, density, uh, mentorship those matter. I think they're under underlying that as an ethos, a culture mm -hmm. that people just imbibe, uh, as a people. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's, that's missing in a lot of places. So Lightship, um, obviously focused on some cool things. I, I wanted to ask the question because this season we're looking at fund managers, which you are, you're a fund manager, you're targeting, uh, entrepreneurs that are doing great things, helping them scale, you're looking for returns. Mm -hmm. I think the, one of the reasons I wanted to do this season specifically of More Than Profit is to talk to the managers of funds who are targeting returns. They're, they're unapologetically looking to get money for their LPs. They, they believe wholeheartedly in their vision, their mission, their fund, the entrepreneurs they're backing, and they're, they're going after it. Um, and because I think where I am in Louisville, and I'm sure you experience this in Cincinnati, a lot of times people, when they hear of your strategy, there, there's a question, will that return? Is that concessionary? Is, you know, and they maybe not even may not ask it directly. I don't know. I'm sure I'm curious if anybody ever asks you that directly, but you know, I, I, I I'm just floored that in 2021 with where, uh, capital has gone, the movement of ESG, impact investing, you name it, like just this movement of value-driven investing, that we still have tons of skepticism in the middle of America, that you can align this unbelievable purpose, like backing entrepreneurs and unapologetically pursue outsized returns. What's that been like for you? How, how has that journey been? Have you ever experienced that, going out talking to investors? Like anybody roll their eyes, raise their eyebrows as you're talking about what you're trying to do and targeting returns? Oh, for sure. I mean, we have been <laughs> another softball, but yes, <laughs> yes, very much Bryce. Um, you know, and you have to just kind of like, and anybody that knows me knows that my facial expressions are like very intense. And so I've had to work on my eyebrows and my face a little bit. Um, but you know, really early on when we were talking to our mentors, we there were some ter there was some terminology that we always made certain that was in the, in what we were saying. So um, market failure, right? So we talked about that market failure with every single person. We talked about we are not a social impact fund. We're looking to get market rate returns on this fund. So there was something we always said in every single pitch, um, so that people realize that that's not why we were here. Um, and so. It's, it's been a kind of constant thing that we've had to discuss with people. Um, but really like drilling down on the actual data behind your return on investment with a diverse team, with a diverse board. These are all facts. And so we're constantly having to lay out the facts for people. Um, and I think we are at the point where we know who is never going to tell us, give us a yes, and who will mm. potentially give us a yes? Um, we've done, and, and Brian talks about this actually quite a bit, um, black GPs or actually black founders just in general do really well with angel investors because there is a one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, you know, mo mo most of my LPs are um, old white dudes, right? Um, and people automatically assume that every old white dude has some level of bias, right? Um, but lots of old white dudes have that one black friend. And why? Because they had a one-on-one -on -one connection, right? They know them as people, right? So as soon as everybody like in the world realizes like we can just all be people and meet one-on-one, -on -one, that really works. So for us, we've done really well with 
um, you know, individual ultra high net worth um, investors. Um, and it's slower to close that fund, fund of funds, foundation, et cetera, because what you end up with is a group of people on an investment committee. And you don't know which one of those people is asymptomatic for bias. Mm, um, and the power dynamics. Yeah. And you've got that one person who you don't know why they're saying no. Right. Yeah. They might be saying no just because and they can hide behind the group. They can hide behind the group. And that's exactly what we, we have run into. Um, but, you know, once you show the numbers for us, we've been slowly building this portfolio and raising money. Um, and so we're at eight investments right now. And what's undeniable is the amount of revenue and the amount of traction for the first eight. And so we're proving that as we're going toward close at the end of June. Um, and so it's the numbers. The numbers work any, for anyone, right? Yeah. So as long as you can prove the numbers, um, it, it works. I did want to, I want to go back to, because I think it's fascinating because we, I did a podcast last week with Glenn Yelton. He's been in the ESG space for two and a half decades. He were, he's the head of ESG at Invesco. And, you know, we, so we were talking about terminology, why terms, definitions matter. I think it's interesting that you would emphatically say you're not a social impact fund when by definition you are. Yep. And so I would actually, <laughs> because like what I, because, because I, because like technically, and you know, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be the contrarian, a social impact fund is pursuing some sort of social or environmental purpose. Now there's going to be measurement of that. Like, so the distinctive typically is, is it going to be quantifiable and measurable and then report it to the LPs as a part of the overall investment strategy? I think, I think what I'm curious, why, why not just embrace that? What, what, is, what is wrong with saying that you're a social impact fund? Oh, there's nothing wrong with saying it. Um, absolutely. And certainly by definition, that's what we are. But we, what we've seen with some of our peers, minority peers, is it has limited their um, opportunity for raising a fund. Yes. Thank you. Is that right? I was, I was hoping you would say <laughs> that. I was hoping you would say that. No, I mean like, and I wasn't trying to like tee you up and like, but I think... That's why the terms matter. And I think there's also like where, and this is what Glenn and I were talking about last week in Louisville, the investors that I talked to when they hear social impact and it's not bad because it, it's, it is this squishy spectrum. The, they immediately jump to the impact strategy of local foundations yes. that is concessionary. Yeah. And it's charity. And so it's charity. It's charity with, you know, like a, you know, some return or at least a return on capital, but not a return on investment, not a capitalistic approach to pursuing market driven returns. You know, like, and I think there's, especially in mid America, and that's kind of, and that's why I was excited to talk to you. You're focused on female founders, founders of color, LGBTQ founders, like these founders that are under, underestimated in mid America. And a lot of the investors you're going to talk to are in mid America. And so their first thing is social impact lights off. That's concessionary. Yeah. We're done. Let's not even have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so it's, it's just interesting. I saw that on your website in everything you guys talk about. Yeah. Like, we put it on the website. Impact. It's not just on the deck. Like I, I need, love it. It's great. I need everybody to know it's, this is not what we're doing here. This. Oh, and like, and I printed off an article, like, and I've highlighted, like, here's an article, like, <laughs> that you're literally saying, we're making it clear this is not a social impact fund. We're capitalists at heart. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because some of our LPs, they're very clear. <laughs> I love it. I want this I love money it. back what? times X. <laughs> Exactly. Well, and I think you want that too, because what you're trying to prove is that the market has failed Absolutely. these underestimated founders. And by doing outsized returns and proving that, it's like, well, what, what else can we unlock? Yeah. And I, love, I think it's helpful because it's like, here you are, a venture fund manager working with these amazing entrepreneurs, trying to reframe and redefine how we think about capital in America. And that, and you're targeting the very things that people say that they needed, which is return. And five, ten years from now, you're gonna be able to turn back and be like, "Look at what we did." Yeah. And hopefully, not just fifty millions unlocked, but billions and trillions of dollars continues to move towards. Like, I, I'm hoping that you're successful 
I know you'll be successful because of what you can unlock, you know, into the future for just regular companies. Just, and that's and where, they're so good. <laughs> they're, they're so, so good. Oh, and it's, it's, it's so good. They, they send their monthly updates and I'm like, you did what? Like, you know. know, we make an investment there to, you know, a couple hundred thousand, six months later, like, or less than six months later, they doubled it. And you're just like, that's all it took. Like, I know. it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I am curious, uh, just as an aside, like there's been a big push as well around alternatives to equity, you know, in the last several years. Mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at that? Do you have any opinion on kind of like what that looks like for founders, revenue-based financing or profit sharing or co-ops? Like, have you seen any of that through your pipeline as a, as a way to support founders across the country? We are trying to figure out different ways because we have a focus on, one of the focuses on uh, CPG companies, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you have the proper working capital? Um, yeah. and not spend everything that you've raised. Um, that one still is difficult, and I think we're working on it. Um, we've got to figure out a way to help, you know, this particular demographic with their that first little bit of money to get started. Um, for some, it's like a ten to $25,000 gap to really prove the concept. Um, and that's really usually filled by friends and family. So, like, where how do we fill that that one like ten to twenty five thousand dollar gap to really jump start um, more yeah. women and minority founders. But I mean, other than that, I mean, crowdfunding has been great for several Black founders. Um, you look at you know Start Engine in particular. Um, that has that has been fantastic. Quite a few Black female founders um, have raised that kind of one million and gotten them, themselves started just based on their network. So. Um, mm. No, those are the only two I can yeah. really think about. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we, 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 we're big believers in like, we need more, more and more and better. Like, yeah. we need venture, venture fits certain types of companies. Absolutely. I think personally, what I'd like to do is try to think about like, how do we reimagine success? So we don't, we don't push entrepreneurs into one definition of success. So, you know, like founders you work with, venture backable companies, growing high growth companies, awesome. And that's great. That's a certain path. Someone that goes out and raises revenue by his financing or debt financing from a bank is able to get, you know, the guarantees or whatever. That's successful. You're building, you're building jobs, you're building wealth, you're reinvesting in your community. That's what we want. I think sometimes with entrepreneurs, as I've seen, it's like if you're, if you're not that venture company raising traditional equity on that safe or convertible note or whatever, that you're like almost like a tier two entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's part of what I'm trying to help kind of reimagine where it's like, I, I think we need it all. Like, I think the more ways we can reimagine capital to support founders, we're going to be better for it. Yeah. My, so my, one of my first companies, um, was a, um, stroller franchise. So you push babies in the mm. stroller at the mall or at the park. Yeah. Um, and I put some money in with my dad and bought this little tiny franchise. Um, and so the second thing was a fitness studio and I got a bank from, um, a tribal nation out West. Um, I couldn't find a regular bank to fund what I was doing. And, um, that's how I got started. And that's, that was my path into entrepreneurship. Doesn't make one better than the other. One can guide you into one, one can guide you back into the other. So, you know, I started with a brick and mortar. Yeah. Well, I love one of your portfolio companies. I'm a huge fan of Fresh Fry. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and I tell the story uh, because it, I think it highlights exactly what you're saying. Like he, one of the first dollars they got was a 0% Kiva loan. I did not and, know that. Yeah. I, and, cool. I mean, Jeremiah is one of the most humble people that you'll ever meet. Ever. Like, and he has been grinding for years <laughs> and like, and that's what I mean. Like the hustle of these founders is just phenomenal, but like, yeah, one of his first dollars. And then he did a $35,000 loan with us at, you know, character based, no collateral required. And now he's, he's raised, he's one of your portfolio companies, raised $3 million of equity, venture backable. I mean, the dude's killing it and I couldn't be prouder, but to your point, he started with a 0% Kiva loan we never know where people are going to end up. We never, never know, know if something that like, you never know. And, and why so do it's we like, get to that's decide? Think, you know? Exactly. Like, why, why are, why are we the gatekeepers point. to success? That's a really good point. <laughs> well, 
thank you for your, I could talk all day to you. Uh, I wanted to ask one one final question. Like I ask, uh, I've been asking everybody this season on it, and it kind of came out of a conference I went to last year, which which was looking at kind of this this notion of of impact, value based investing, kind of going mainstream. And I think anytime people talk about something going mainstream, there are there are fears and there's excitement, you know, there's, there's, there's hopes and there's pauses. Like as you think about the future and what you're trying to build with Lightship and, and what you're pressing forward towards with um, supporting under, underestimated founders, what gives you hope? Um, and I, I'll rephrase it cause I always like to end with hope. What gives you pause as you look to the future? You know, look, looking back at 2020, all that happened, what, what still kind of gives you some pause as you look to the future? I know you, as the Energizer Bunny, you've got to be the most hopeful person. So much hope. But I'm sure there are some things that give you pause as you think about the future. And then what gives you hope? Like what are you unbelievably excited about for the future as you look forward? Well, so what gives me pause um, is that history has shown that people forget very mm. easily. Um, we forget when tragedy happens. Um, we forget, you know, we forget those inflection points and we sometimes ease back into bad habits. Um, so that's the, I think that's the thing that scares me the most. Um, but I'm hopeful if I look at, at, the, at the past, right, the roaring 20s after a, another mm -hmm. pandemic, that some amazing things can happen over the next decade. And we hope that those things will, will help things shift. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited um, to know who the next Yalitza Jean Charles is from Healthy Roots Dolls. I hope that she's a household name. People know Build-A-Bear, right? I'm excited to, to see a founder's name on a screen and for the world to know them. And for us to not just instantly think, who's the next Elon Musk? Who's the next Mark Zuckerberg? Um, who's the next Steve Jobs? Those are all white men. And I hope that we can look to some women and to some people of color. So I'm hopeful for that. Um, and I feel that the world is finally ready for it. 